Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Picks and Sight for Dummies Like Me. In today's video, we're going to do a monochrome workflow with narrowband data. We'll start off by going to File, Open, and I think we'll go with the Elephant Trunk Nebula today because I have S, H, and O data. This will give us the Hubble Color Palette. With your photos loaded in, we want to start off by closing out of the Auto Crop Mask. We don't need these. Here is our sulfur data. We have another auto crop mask for oxygen. Then we've got our real oxygen data. Same thing for H alpha. There we go. Step number one for me is always to rename our photos. My H alpha image I'll rename to uppercase H. The oxygen data will be uppercase O. And the sulfur data will be an uppercase S. Then we'll minimize all three images or shade them and create a nice little column up top here. So we have S H O, which is the Hubble color palette. For step number two, we're going to create our color photo. And there's a couple different ways we can do this. Let's start off with the method that we learned in the previous video. For this, we'll go to the process explorer on the left and then grab channel combination. It should be listed here now that you've used it once or twice. If not, remember, you can always search for it up top. With the channel combination tool, the easiest way to do this is if you've renamed your photos to SHO, then just enter the file names SHO. We're mapping sulfur to the red color channel, H alpha to the green color channel, and then oxygen to the blue color channel. This gives us the Hubble color palette. Next, we click on the circle icon to create our color photo. And if we want to see a preview of the image, we'll hit Ctrl or Command A. At least we can see the nebula now. This would be a good time to rename the photo as well. Rather than image 07, I'll call this SHO. That was one way to create a color photo. A more advanced way is with the Pixel Math tool. This is one of the things we cover a lot more in my Deep Space course. With the Pixel Math tool, we want to access the red, green, and blue color channels independently. For this reason, we're going to turn off the check mark here for use a single RGBK expression. Now we can access red, green, and blue. And if we use that same idea from earlier, we can put S for red, H for green, O for blue. These are case sensitive, by the way, so make sure you are doing either uppercase or lowercase. Then we click on destination, create a new image, and if we want a color photo, then the color space has to be set to RGB color. Now that you have S mapped to red, H mapped to green, and O mapped to blue, create a new image, RGB color, we're going to click on the square icon. When we click on the square icon, we have another color photo which looks identical to the original. All right, let's get back on track. I've shown you two different ways to create a color photo. That was step number two, create your color image. And at any time, you can hit Ctrl or Command A to auto stretch the photo to see things better. Step number three is to run Blur Exterminator with Correct Only. Because if we take a look at our photo up close, very often what we'll find is that the stars are not exactly sharp or spherical. To be honest, they don't look that bad here, but it's always a good idea for step number three to run Blur Exterminator with Correct Only. And we can do this by dragging and dropping the triangle onto the photo. See how much sharper they are after? All right, step number four is to color correct the photo. In the previous video, I showed you spectrophotometric color calibration. What you need to understand about narrowband imaging, though, is that this tool is not nearly as helpful with narrowband data. If you want to give it a try, though, first change the white reference to photon flux. Next, you're going to turn on narrowband filters mode. And from here, you need to enter the exact wavelength and bandwidth of your three narrowband filters. By default, it gives you the HOO filter list, which is 656 for H alpha, and then 500 for both green and blue. That's your oxygen data. If we're doing SHO, though, then 656, which is H alpha, is being mapped to the green color channel. So we'll type in 656.3 for green. Then we need to figure out sulfur, which is, I think, 672. Now we have 672 for red, 656 for green, 500 for blue. 
And for those of you who have no idea what these numbers are, let's do a quick bit of research. First up, we're just going to Google H alpha wavelength, and it tells us it's 656.28, in other words, 656.3, which we have for our green color channel. As for the bandwidth, this depends on the filters that you purchased. In my case, I have the ZWO, narrowband filters. On ZWO's website, we can see that the band pass is 7 nanometers for all three of the filters. You'd want to do the same research for whatever brand that you purchased. It also tells us that the sulfur is set to 672. Let's implement all that information back in SPCC. So we have 672, 656, and then 500, all at 7 nanometers. That should be good enough for right now. Let's drag and drop the triangle onto the photo and see what happens. It looks like it found 974 stars, represented by the green dots. That's a good sign. We can close out of the graph. Then we'll hit Ctrl or Command A to auto stretch the photo. And that does not look very good. The nebula is now very green and our background is purple. One thing we could try to fix that is a background neutralization. For this, we turn on the region of interest, grab a new preview mode tool up top, and our goal is to find part of the photo with no nebulosity or dust. That can be very tricky if you're photographing a nebula that fills up the entire frame. I do have one region here though that's pretty much uh, pitch black, so I'll select that. Choose this for my preview. And if we run SPCC again, let's see what happens. Things definitely look different, and if I hit Ctrl or Command A, now the image is very green. I think I might have another problem though. This may well happen to you. What you want to do is go back to Process Explorer, grab the Screen Transfer function, and verify that the chain link is turned on. If the chain link is turned off and you nuke the photo, you're not going to get accurate colors. So be sure the chain link is turned on. All right, so that was SPCC. That was step number four, I believe. We have neutralized the color cast. The only problem is that the image is very green now. I'm going to delete this preview, by the way, just to get rid of it. You can do that by right-clicking on Preview 1 and choosing Delete. What I was going to say, though, is that the reason this image is so green is because H-alpha is the brightest color channel. At any time, you can come up where it says RGB and change this to red, green, or blue. If I change it to red, this is our sulfur data, and you can barely see anything. By comparison, green is much brighter and has a lot more detail. That was our H alpha. Blue, this is where we mapped oxygen, it's quite a bit darker as well. So whatever color channel is your brightest, that's going to be the predominant color cast in the photo. The next step in our workflow, which should be number five, is actually to run Blur Exterminator for a second time. The first time we ran this, we were just focused on the correct only. For this second attempt though, I want to sharpen the stars and the nebula or the galaxy. If you're not sure what settings to use, you can always reset the tool to the default. Try that, and if it looks good, stick with it. If not, you can always undo it, try a different value, and see how that goes. I think these settings will work for me today though. I've turned off correct only. Then I'll drag and drop the triangle onto the photo. And if we do our before and after now, what we'll hopefully see is that the data here is considerably sharper than it was before. All right, it might not be considerably, but it's uh, slightly sharper than before. Next, we're going to run Star Exterminator. With Star Exterminator, we'll generate a star image. Then we'll drag and drop the triangle onto the photo to run Star Exterminator. Feel free to just minimize these stars for right now. We don't need them right away. And I find removing the stars to be very helpful because without those stars in the way, we can really start to hone in on the nebula or the galaxy. I know that some of you may be shooting at a wider focal length and you might have some weird gradients in the photo. In that case, you'd want to go back to your process explorer and then look for their new tool, which is gradient correction. This just came out the other day, but with gradient correction, basically you just stick with the default settings, but turn on automatic convergence and then apply this to the photo. This should fix any weird gradients in your image, which I don't have any today, so I'm not going to worry about it. But this would be something to do at this point in the workflow. 
For those that did have a gradient, it should now be fixed and we can move on with the workflow. The next step is to get rid of this overly green color cast, which most people don't like. For this, we'll go back to the Process Explorer, and we're looking for a script called Narrowband Normalization. Narrowband Normalization is an optional plugin that I had you install in the first video in this series. So if you cannot find this, you have to go back, rewatch episode number one, get all those repositories installed, and then you can follow along with us today. The way this tool works is you're going to start off by clicking on the Real Time Preview button. That's that hollow circle. The first thing you want to play around with is the palette. We have HOO, SHO, HSO, etc. I know that we don't have HOO data today, but that doesn't mean we can't try it. And for this, we come down to the blend mode and try method one, two, and three. It's really not working well, but I just want you to be aware that you could play around with this stuff. Rather than HOO, let's try SHO, because that's the data that we have. There we go. In order to remove the green, we'll increase the SCNR amount. However, when we do this, we're negatively affecting the brightness of the photo. For this reason, I want you to change lightness to either preserve or HA. I'm going to stick with preserve for today. Once you find the lightness method that you prefer, we can come back to our sliders and move them around. Maybe you want a little bit of green, that's fine. For me though, and for most people, we try to get rid of any trace of that green. Then we adjust the O3 boost. This will make the blues a bit more intense. And the sulfur boost will increase the brightness and the saturation of the yellows and the reds. You have to watch though, because with my data, I only had maybe two or three hours. And so we have a lot of color noise throughout the photo, which is being exacerbated by these sliders. This is one of the reasons why I stress so heavily in my deep space course to capture as much data is possible. I'm talking eight hours, 16 hours, maybe even 32 hours for some people, because the more data you have, the further you can process the image and overall the better photos that you can get. If you like the overall color balance, another thing you can play around with is the shadow point slider. As you move that to the left, it will affect the colors in your image. You don't want to go too far here, but a little bit might help the photo. I think this will work for today, considering we did not have as much data as I would like. And if we compare that to the original, it's a night and day difference. When you're happy with the changes, we'll close out of the real-time preview. Then we'll drag and drop the triangle onto the photo to apply the narrowband normalization. The next step in the workflow is to clean up that grain because it is pretty intense. For this, we'll use Noise Exterminator. If you don't have it listed here, just search for it. And because we do have so much grain, I'm going to push the denoise to maybe even like 0.9. Try that. It's a lot better than it was. So here's our before and after. I should mention that we lost a little bit of color information in here. But still, I think the trade-off was worth it. Okay, I think our image turned out pretty nice. We can now probably stretch it and then do our color and contrast adjustments. However, let's go back to that stars photo, which you should still have lying around. The stars photo still has a lot of green stars throughout the image. For this reason, we could go to the Process Explorer and then type in SCNR. SCNR is a very powerful tool that can remove a green color cast from your photo. So if you find that your background is very green or your stars are too green, whatever, open up SCNR, put the color to remove to green, start off with a value of one, drag and drop the triangle on the photo. And if we do our before and after, you can see that almost every star was green. Now there's no more green. That's just a good trick to know. All right, so let's get back to the main workflow and stretch our photos. For this, we'll grab the screen transfer function and the histogram transformation. You might want to pause the video until you can find both of those and open them up. When you've got them though, remember the first thing we do is turn on the check mark for both tools. This confirms that we're working with the same photo, in my case, SHO. Next, we drag the triangle from the screen transfer function to the bottom of the histogram window, where it's kind of beige. That copies over the preview stretch. Then we need to apply it to our photo. 
We do that by clicking on the square icon on the histogram tool. Everything goes crazy, so we reset both tools. After we reset both tools, we have a permanently stretched image. Let's do that again for our stars. All we have to do is click on the stars photo, drag and drop the triangle, click on the square, reset, reset. At this point, we have now stretched our stars in our nebula. You're free to do whatever contrast, color, and detail adjustments that you want to the photo. And because this is the Pix and Sight for Dummies Like Me course, we're gonna keep this very simple with a curves transformation. Normally though, I would save these images as TIFFs and then take them into Photoshop for much more advanced processing. This is something I cover extensively in my Deep Space course. Today though, we'll start off here with a curve, turn on the check mark icon. Pretty much any time you see a check mark, it should be turned on for most of these tools. Next, we click on the real-time preview. This allows us to see what we're doing. And if you want to add more contrast, adjust the RGBK, which is the default. You can add a point, drag it down to make that area darker in terms of your brightness. Add another point and drag it up to make it brighter. And that one thing alone has really transformed the image. If you're feeling a bit adventurous, you can also go to the S for saturation and add a point near the middle and drag it up for even more color. I tend to like really contrasty, colorful photos myself. If you're happy with those changes, we'll close out of the real-time preview, drag and drop the triangle onto the photo to apply it. It looks great. Next, we'll reset the tool, and we can try adjusting the red, green, and blue color channels independently. For this, we turn on the real-time preview again, and maybe you want to add more red to the yellow colors in the photo. So that's kind of like the bright parts of the image. For that reason, I'll add a point near the middle and bring that up. I don't want it to necessarily affect the shadows though. So I'll add a point where it's darker and drag that down. If we do our before and after, you can see we've added more red. To be honest, this is another reason I prefer using Photoshop because I have way more fine control over the opacity and everything else. So that's another reason you might want to check out my Deep Space course if you want to see more advanced ways to do this. Then we could go to the green color channel. If we find that there's still some green in the shadows, we'll add a point and subtract it. We can always add another point near the highlights so and bring back some of that green. And it's always advisable to do a before and after just to confirm these changes look good. Finally, we have the blue color channel. Maybe just add a little bit more blue overall. This is entirely stylistic though, so do whatever looks good to you. If you're happy with that, we'll apply this to the photo. And I think that was an important change because before there was still some green, it looks a bit sickly by comparison to the new version. If you want, you can reset the tool one more time and adjust anything else that you see fit. Maybe even go back to RGBK, add another real-time preview, and continue to tweak the contrast, whatever looks good to you. If you inspect your photo now, you might find that there's more color noise than there was originally. For this reason, it might not be a bad idea to run Noise Exterminator for a second time. Although the settings could be a lot lower. Maybe just like 0.3 for the denoise, let's try that. And that didn't really do anything, so we'll bump it back up to maybe 0.5. And it's still not working that well. This would be another time I would say, let's just go over to Photoshop because I know a very simple and powerful way to fix the color grain in Camera Raw. But because this is pick and sight, we're gonna unfortunately have to avoid that one for today. I should mention that the more advanced Pix and Sight users on YouTube will go into a lot more detail on what's possible, including unsharp mask, adding structure and detail to the photo, doing perhaps some selective color, etc. So while I'm not necessarily showing you all that's available, just understand that there is a lot you can do if you're feeling adventurous and you're willing to experiment. Let's just try the selective color for today though. We'll find this under script, toolbox, Selective color correction. This will only be available though if you followed the first video and installed all the repositories. This tool is very similar to the one that you can use in Photoshop called Selective Color. You start off with your color channel that you want to affect, whether that's red, green, blue, magenta, etc. Let's go with yellow for today. And then you adjust your sliders. By adding cyan to the yellow color channel, I've affected their appearance. If I subtract cyan, that will make them more red. 
And in this way, you can really fine tune the color cast in your photo. Then we have the magenta slider. I could do the same thing. Move it one way. If it looks good, stick with it. If it doesn't, move it the other way. Then we have the yellow color channel for yellow. You also have red, green, and blue, which is kind of odd, but just move the sliders and see if it looks good one way or not. And all of that was just for the yellow color channel. We could do the same thing for, in this case, cyan. We have a lot of cyan here in the middle. I could add more cyan to the cyan color. It'll probably really screw it up. Then we could do magenta. And finally, yellow. Let's say you've spent a few minutes, you've gone through each one of the main color channels. If you like it, just click on apply. When it's complete, you can close out of the tool. And here's our before and after. It's actually way more subtle than I thought it would have been, but better to underdo it than overdo it. This would be a very good time to save a PixInsight project with File, Save Project. Then you'll click on the folder icon, navigate to your Elephant Trunk directory if you're doing the Elephant Trunk anyway. And we could call this Elephant SHO version 1, for example. Save that as a PixInsight project, hit OK. And the reason we're doing that is if we want to come back to this whole workflow tomorrow, Everything will be restored as you see here right now. And this is important because it gives us the ability to go back and do a version two, a version three, etc. This is one of the most fundamental aspects of the Deep Space course, is that we're always iterating upon what we've done before. We have to start somewhere. So if this is my version one. If I look at this image two days from now, I might say, you know what? The yellows are a bit too red, or the image overall has too much contrast, who knows? I'm not going to see any problems until I've had a few days away from the image. So in this way, if I want to come back to the photo, I'll go to File, Load Project, let's say next week, find the file that we worked on. We'll come right back to this step in the workflow. And here's another thing I haven't shown you yet, but if you right click on the name tag, you can choose Load History Explorer. This is very powerful because now you can see everything you've done to this particular image. For example, if I click on SPCC, it tells me all the things that I did behind the scenes. Or perhaps I click on Blur Exterminator, it even tells me the sharpened stars amount, the sharpened on stellar. And in this way, you can remember what you've done, even if it was two weeks ago. Anyway, let's finish up with the workflow for today. The final step is to add our stars back in and then optionally do a star reduction. For this, we'll grab the Pixel Math tool from our Process Explorer. This should be somewhere here because we've used it once or twice by now. You might already have an equation here from earlier. If so, the fastest way to fix this is to click on the reset button in the lower right. Now we're back to the default settings. And our equation for today is combine parentheses. In my case, we have SHO. That's the file name of this photo. And then we have our SHO stars back here. I need to enter this file name as well. So we'll do SHO comma SHO underscore stars comma OP underscore screen. Open close parentheses and then a second close parentheses. This is always our equation which we've learned from Adam Block. If you're ready to apply this, we'll create a new image. Then we'll click on the square icon. But we have an error. This will likely happen to you sooner or later. It says no such image. Well, it's not very descriptive, but basically what's telling us is that we don't have a photo which we have in our equation. If I were to look very closely, I would note that the SHO underscore stars has an uppercase S that is not reflected in the actual file. It's a lowercase s. That's what I mean. If even one character is wrong, this equation doesn't work. That's one of the tricks about learning pixel math. So now that I understand that was the problem, I'll do a lowercase s. And with any luck at all, if we click on the square now, there we go. We blended the two together. It actually looks really nice. Then I'll minimize the pixel math, get it up out of the way. And let's rename this photo from image 93 to SHO V1 or final, something like that. If you feel that the image could use a star reduction, we'll find that under Process Explorer, type in star reduction, all one word. And if you can't find this again, this will be something we covered in the first video here in this series, because it is an optional script. Nothing's going to happen until we choose a starless view, which in my case is called SHO. 
You might have it called nebula, whatever. Then you can try changing the different reduction methods, but star method's a good one to start off with. I think the default settings are fine, so if you're ready, we'll click on the green check mark to apply the star reduction. And when we compare the before and after, I do think that the star reduction helped out. If you're happy with your star reduced image, we can now save this as a TIFF or a JPEG or both. For this, we'll go up to File, Save As. Just make sure when you're doing this, you actually have the right file selected, by the way. And as you can see here, I've got a TIFF folder and a JPEG folder. I'll start off by saving a TIFF. We'll change the type to TIFF. I'm going to call this, I guess, version 3 for me today. 16-bit unsigned integer is not a bad idea for your TIFF file, just so it's more compatible with Photoshop. If you don't care about Photoshop, though, stick with the default 32-bit. That's fine. We'll hit OK. And then we'll save a second version, which is our JPEG. The quality should always be 100 and embed the ICC profile, which hopefully is sRGB. Again, that's something else we talk about in the Deep Space course, because if you don't have the right color space, then there's a good chance if you upload your photos online, they're not going to look the same as they do on your computer. And more often than not, they look way worse. So that's something you want to learn about. That concludes our basic workflow, though, for monochrome cameras with a narrowband filter. I hope you've seen just how easy PixInsight can be with a little bit of practice using some of these tools. We're not doing all kinds of crazy stuff here. We're just dragging a few triangles, occasionally entering a small little equation here and there. But fundamentally, this program is not that hard to get your mind wrapped around as long as you start to go through methodically, do the steps that I've shown you, and form a firm foundation. Once you have this foundation, you're comfortable with the interface, you're comfortable going through the motions. At that point, you can start to add some more advanced techniques, which you might see from some other content creators. Those things that they show you might make a lot more sense now. My final word today is that everything we've done here has just been version one of this edit. It would not be a bad idea to come back with the same exact data and start over from the beginning tomorrow or next week. Go through, do the same exact steps, but do a slightly different curves transformation and selective color at the end. Then compare version one to version two. And with two images, you can very quickly decide what you like and what you don't like. Then you'll have version three. So hang in there, keep at it, and I think within a few weeks or even just a few days, you're really going to start to get the hang of PixInsight, and this program will seem a lot less intimidating than it did just a few days ago. So if you enjoyed today's video, be sure to check out the 2024 edition of my Deep Space course. We go into way more detail. We have dozens and dozens of videos that go through all the different objects, multiple different workflows, and much more. I'll have links for all this stuff down below, but thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you guys in another video.